Hello, my name is Ian McCall, and this is a video from the Student uh, Skin Consult Undergraduate Dermatology course presented by the Australian Institute of Dermatology. Today, we're going to look at conducting a skin examination. So, let's have a little look at the relevant area on the website, examining the skin. How do you examine the skin? Well, the first thing is you have to get the patient disrobed, or at least down to undergarments, and provide a gown, certainly for females. There's an art to performing a good skin examination, but part of that art is to make sure you've got good light. Now, natural daylight's best, but fluorescent light is, uh, is okay. So what do you look at for a rash? Well, First of all, you want to get an overview of the distribution of the rash. Look to see if it's symmetrical. This particular lash looks pretty symmetrical. If it is, it suggests an endogenous process rather than some reaction to something from the outside. Another thing to always look for uh, in a rash, look to see if it's a photosensitive distribution. Um, uh, look to see, you know, is it on the external aspects of the arms? Uh, or the backs of the hands? Is it involving the V of the neck? Uh, and the face is the sparing under the chin where the, the sun can't reach and behind the ears. So if you've got a rash that's tending to be just on exposed areas of the arms and legs and sparing in those areas, then it's, it's going to be a photosensitive rash. And that tells you a lot. It tells you it might be a drug. It tells you it might be lupus. You go looking for particular diseases. So it's a fact that skin diseases have a very definite pattern of presentation. Often you can just tell what a disease is because of uh, where it's presenting. For example, atopic eczema. Typically, it's going to affect the front of the elbows and behind the knees. Whereas psoriasis is going to be the points of the elbows and the knees. And then you've got pityriasis rosea. Uh, this is a viral condition that occurs in the trunk. You get a herald patch, a lesion that looks like a big ringworm. And then a few days up to a week later, you suddenly get a series of oval-shaped lesions following the lines of the ribs and the chest wall. And this is so characteristic that you can virtually make your diagnosis just on the distribution. And then acne. It basically affects the grease gland distributed areas in the face, the upper chest, and the, and the back. So... Distribution, look for the distribution of the rash. It tells you a lot about what the condition is likely to be. This, this rash here, this is bullous pemphigoid. These are blisters, blisters that tend to come in flexures initially, and then they'll come out in other exposed areas. It's an autoimmune bullous disease. Okay, so you've looked at the distribution of the, the rash. What's the next thing that you want to ask to examine? Okay, the answer, a new lesion. You want to see what the basic pathology is, and that's going to be, to, uh, you're going to get that from a new lesion. You see, uh, why you want to see a new lesion is that because if lesions are itchy, they're often excoriated or scratched, and it's the new lesion that will give you information as to the disease process going on. I mean, we often like to divide skin diseases into red scaly, red non-scaly, pustular, vesicular, and bullous diseases. But bullic uh, blisters can burst easily, and so you get a crust. So you need to know that there was a, a blister there first to put it in the right category. Now, there is a nice, if you're not sure how to describe skin lesions, there's a nice website on morphology that you can go to um, called the Dermatology Lexicon Project where if you um, click on one particular area, up will come a description of what it is with a little image, and you can click here to see an enlargement. So this is a very useful little website for skin morphology, the Dermatology Lexicon Project. Let's just go back. Though. So what was I getting at? Looking for the primary pathology. Now, look at this one here. These are excoriated vesicles at the wrist, and this is very suggestive of scabies. So what are you going to examine now? You want to see if you've seen the primary lesion. You want to look at the orifices and the rest of the skin. In other words, you want to look at the, the, the hair, the nails. 
You want to look inside the mouth. Um, let's have a look and see. Now, I've said there, it's important you check all the skin surface areas, including the orifices. So also, check the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. Look specifically there. Look in the flexures, especially the groin. Check the genital areas. Now, you've got to be careful here. Um, it's certainly easier to check genital areas in males than it is in females. If you're a male doctor and you've got a female patient, get a chaperone if you're going to be examining that area. Start doing that early. You won't get into any trouble. Um, males, why do you want to look at the genitals? Because often I can diagnose scabies from scabetic nodules occurring on the scrotum. Or it's, so, it's such a classic sort of picture that if you see it, it doesn't matter what else is happening in the body. You know that patient. If they don't have scabies at the moment, they've had it uh, very recently. Always look at the nails. You know, you get so much information from the nails. See if they're normal. See if they're clubbed. Or is the nail lifted off the nail bed and as an anecolysis, separation of the nail from the nail bed? Look to see if there's any ridges in the nails. You know, longitudinal ridging is quite normal. Horizontal ridging on bow's lines indicates there's some disorder of nail growth, usually a traumatic episode where someone's been acutely ill. Um, look at the posterior nail fold. Why do you want to do that? Well, look to see if it's ragged. Um, as you would expect in dermatomyositis. Let me just show you what I mean. This is from the Global Skin Atlas. Look at that posterior nail fold there. Look how ragged um, that uh, is there. Um, this is uh, a classic picture in dermatomyositis. You can also get other information from the posterior nail fold. If you've got a dermatoscope, you can look at the um, distribution and the nature of the capillary loops in this area. And that can be useful in conditions such as lupus and scler well, mainly in scleroderma rather than, uh, rather than in lupus. So let's go back. Now, I've said look at the orifices, look in, in the mouth, look at the lips. Um, the lower lip will tend to be involved if you've got actinic chelitis because the sun tends to hit the lower lips. The lips can be the site of lichen planus or lupus. And again, it's the lower lip in lupus because that's the bit that gets the sun. Look inside the mouth at the hard palate if you're thinking of uh, viral infections. Look at the buccal surfaces if you're looking for the lacy white structures of lichen planus. Let's just take a quick glance at that. There. This is in the inside of the mouth. These are the lacy uh, white areas that you can see in lichen planus affecting the inside of the mouth. There's some other images down here with it affecting the tongue and the like as well. Uh, what else? Yeah, the sclerae. Remember the blue sclerae of osteogenesis imperfecta, or the discoloration of the sclerae in alcaptinuria, where it goes black, or yellow sclerae when you're jaundiced. And then the iris. Look for leash nodules in neurofibromatosis. So there's so much information you can get if you just specifically direct your eyes to look at it. Uh, uh, that's particular areas and look with intent then you'll see things. So what about this one here? The swollen upper lip, this is a condition called the Melkerson Rosenthal syndrome or granulomatous chelitis. It's a granulomatous swelling of unknown cause. Now, I think as I've said there are a lot of dermatologies like that. Fascinating but frustrating to treat. So what have I said there? What's wrong with these lips? What are the main abnormal features you would look at with hair? Well, this upper lip's chronically swollen. Look how swollen it is relative to the lower lip. And as I said, this is chelitis granulomatosa, granulomatous granulomatous chelitis. Now, what features are you going to look at with hair? Too numerous to mention indeed. Let's have a look. Always check the scalp. You want to see if the hair is growing normally. You want to see is the frontal loss in androgenetic alopecia or um, is, are there bare areas in alopecia areata? The, the areas that have hair loss and fungal infections tend to have broken hairs and scale in the base. Um, feel the texture of the hair. If it's very dry and brittle, then the patient may have hypothyroidism. Um, do a hair pull test. Just pull a few little hairs there between your fingers, your, your index and thumb, and see if they, they come out. Now, a few little uh, hairs are are expected. If you see a lot of telogen hairs, you know, hairs that come out from the root with a small bulb in the end, then it indicates that the patient may have the condition telogen effluvium, which is one of the commonest causes of sudden hair loss after a recent illness or after pregnancy. 
So look at the hair as well. What's this abnormality in the tip of the tongue? Well, it's a little bit of leukoplakia. And then I've said, when you've examined a patient, you should try to make a diagnosis. How does that help you in your examination? Hmm, come back to that. Leukoplakia, suggesting early possible malignant change, you need to biopsy. Um, now I've said, how does it help you to uh, make, uh, to help you with the examination? If you've made a provisional diagnosis, well, because you should then specifically look at those areas where that disease usually occurs, in case you missed it the first time. What does that mean? Let's have a little look. Yeah, once you've an idea of the disease you're looking for, then look where you'd normally expect to find that disease. Look at the other body sites. For instance, say you've got psoriasis on the external elbows, then you'd look at the knees. You might look at the natal cleft between the buttocks to see if you've got psoriasis, non-scaly psoriasis there. You'd look at the nails to see if there's any pitting on the surface, you know, uh, as, as like a thimble. There are other nail changes in psoriasis as well. You check the scalp to see if there's any psoriasis there because you know that psoriasis is very common in that area. So even though the patient's not complaining of things in these areas, because you know where this disease usually occurs, you go looking for the features. Similarly, say a patient comes in with a very itchy, they're very itchy and they've got excoriated areas in the trunk, and you might consider scabies. I've mentioned this before. Where do you go looking? you look between the finger webs because that's where you may see the uh, scabetic burrow. You look at the front of the wrist, especially the lateral surface, because again, that's where you'll typically find burrows. You check the anterior axillary fold. And remember what I said in males, you check the scrotal and genital skin to see if there are any scabetic nodules. Check the extensor elbows as well because that's where the scabies might tend to concentrate. So the reasons for the actual distribution of these lesions and these, uh, for these conditions in these areas is often not known, but they're highly characteristic. So again, just this one with lichen planus, you look inside the mouth, look and see if that particular pigmentation, the lacy white pigmentation on the buccal surfaces there that I told you about earlier. Um, look at the anterior wrist because that's usually where you see the, polyg uh, the uh, poly polygonal uh, purplish blue papules. And uh, check the scalp, see if there's any sign of lichen planus, uh, lichen planus pilaris there. So, in summary, examination of the skin is important. It's really what a dermatologist does. He knows what to look for. He knows where to look. He's able to infer from what he sees. But you've got to train your eyes to see, and you have to know where to look. And remember that old saying that more things are missed by not looking than by not knowing and in dermatology, this is especially true. Let me turn to this little uh, thing here to finish. Look at this rash. Isn't it a beauty? Look at the stripes that's on this patient's uh, um, abdominal and chest wall. It's a zebra stripe pattern. And this is a very striking one. What's the condition? Um, the condition, we'll come to it. We used to call it digitate dermatosis. Let's have a little look and see. Digitate dermatosis, known also as small plaque parasoriasis. Now, this may be an early form of T-cell lymphoma of the skin, but they're still arguing a little bit about this. My own view is that it is uh, a form first of that condition, um, and it may stay like that for many, many years without developing thick nodules or plaques. Um, now, as I say, the experts are still arguing about this condition, as they are with many other things in dermatology, and I think that's why the specialty is so interesting. So, I hope you've learned a little bit about skin examination today. Make a diagnosis of the disease. Go looking for the other areas where you'd expect to find it. Never forget the orifices. Check the hair and nails. Check the genital areas. You do all that, you'll do a good skin examination, and you won't miss very much. Thank you very much for that. Bye-bye.